Hi guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Radeon Pro Polaris 32 gig card, or the Polaris Radeon, no, Radeon, damn it, Polaris Pro, Pro Duo. It's a dual GPU, uh, dual GPU, uh, dual GPU core GP, uh, card, um, which is why I'm super excited to have the PCB here. It was sent in by a fan of the channel, so huge thanks to him, because I'm a sucker for dual core graphics cards. Um, I have a 7990, I have a 487TX2, I have two GTX 590s, I want to pick up a 690, a 6990, a 5970, and, uh, 295X2, and, like, a bunch of other, like, basically every dual GPU, dual GPU core card there is, I want to have, especially, like, the more modern ones. I know there's, like, like, there's the... There, there's a bunch of really old ones, which I don't even know the specific names of just because they're so old that I didn't keep track of those. But the more modern ones, I really want to get all of those because they're just cool pieces of uh, cool pieces of hardware because of how ridiculous they are. And this one is arguably one of the more ridiculous ones. Now, the cores are admittedly a lot less uh, power hungry than on some of them. Like the 295X2 is pro like the king of the power consumption for, for dual core dual core graphics cards. Oh, there's also the Radeon, uh, the Fury Pro Duo. That one's also pretty ridiculous. But none of them even comes close to the amount of VRAM this thing has, because this is targeted at pro users who do stuff that has to fit, like, and that requires a ton of VRAM. So this thing comes with 32 gigabytes of GDDR5. Now, it's admittedly spread across the two cores, so you get 16 gigs on this core, another 16 gigs on that core. Um, these aren't 16 gigabit memory chips. There's, you know, you can see that there's eight chips. So normally you'd need 16 gigabit chips to get 16 gigabytes. That's not the case here. Um, there's another eight chips for each core on the back of the card, as you can clearly see here. So tons and tons of GDDR5 on this thing. Um, and that that's just like, that already is kind of insane. Um, then you, of course, get the Polaris, uh, these are actually Polaris 20 cores, not the Polaris 10 cores. Um, not that that makes a huge difference, because the Polaris 20 is basically a Polaris 10 that just clocks a bit higher. So, that's kind of that. And then there is just VRMs everywhere, because the special thing about dual GPU graphics cards is that you can't have one vCore VRM, you need to have two of them. And the same is true for basically everything else on the card. So, here we have vCore VRM number one. Controlled by this chip over here. Um, up here we have vMem number one. And then here we have VDDCI number one. And this down here is actually the PLX VRM, so VPLX, and there's only one of those because there's only one PLX chip right here, so that's basically what takes your PCIe slot and splits it between the two GPU cores. The neat thing about this is that if you wanted to, with two of these GPU, like two of these cards, you could run, assuming Polaris supports four-way, I'm not sure, I haven't checked. But if it does support four-way, then with two of these, you could run four-way even on, like, a 16-lane Intel CPU because the PLX chips would basically... Well, a Crossfire from AMD actually doesn't really care how many lanes you give it. Um, but you could run it off of, like, a 4X PCIe slot just fine. Um, even though you'd probably run in... You might run into a bandwidth limit at that point, especially if you're, like, Gen 2.0 instead of 3.0. But yeah, neat thing is that basically with just, you could actually run a four-way on a MATX motherboard with this, which would be pretty neat. Like that would actually be pretty neat. Like I'd, I'd love to see that. <laughs> but anyway, so that's the PLX chip over there with its own VRM. Then we have VDDCI number two. So for the, the second core, right? Is that working out? Yes, that is working out, because this block is vCore 2, controlled by this chip over here. 
which also controls this VRM down here, which is VMEM2. And I think I've labeled all of them, except for these. So these are just some, uh, see, what are you? Oh, that might be gate drive. That's probably gate drive. Hmm. Wait, no, because there's... Give me a second. That's probably 5 volts for... No, because they're going to... This is on 3598, so they can run straight 12 volts into everything. Hmm. Now I really don't know what that chip does. Either way, you do have these two... Um integrated buck converters right here and those are both going to be for the display drives so you're going to have vdisp1 actually no that's two vdisp1 so that's that and then this thing which i have no idea what it powers might be for the bios chips or something like that Because there are, like, there's 5-volt LDOs for the actual, like, the 3 5217s. They have their own little LDO, uh, LDOs to run on. Um, yeah. So that's all the VRMs. Let's take, <laughs> let's take a closer look at some of them. So start, let's just go with vCore 2 here because it's more convenient to look at. The voltage controller is a IR35, IR35217. Um, you should recognize this chip off of a uh, reference Vega. Gee, actually, all of the Vega cards run one of these. So that's just your standard Vega voltage controller here. It's running in 4 plus 1 phase. On Vega, it's been in 6 plus 1 and 7 plus 1 configurations. But here it's in 4 plus 1. So you have a 4 phase vCore VRM. And if you actually look at the back of the card, it might not look like it's a 4 phase because you only have two of these chips right here. But these are, so, you know, you have like two drivers, but these are actually IR3598s. And the 3598 is special because you can put one PWM signal in. Well, no, you put two PWM signals in and you get two drive signals out. So one of these chips can actually drive two phases. Or you can push one PWM signal in and then it splits that signal between two phases. So it can both run as a doubler or as two drivers in one chip. So... That's that thing. That's how AMD gets around their limitation. Like get gets. Uh, that's why there's only one of them for every two phases in the vCore VRMs. That's true for both vCore VRMs on the card. I mean, everything is literally basically mirrored. So, well, not really mirrored, but everything is twice like doubled. Like everything is basically copy pasted twice, except for you know a couple of the VRMs on the card. So then, vCore. 4 plus 1, um, and the 4 plus 1 is, of course, vCore plus mem. So that's basically what that plus sign indicates, because I've had a few people ask me about that, like, what's the 4 plus 1 deal? It's just, like, four phases for one output plus one phase for the other output, which the plus one is down here. Now then, uh, what actually makes up each of these lovely phases? Do note that, like, these phases are just copy-pasted everywhere right like this is the same as this is the same as this as the as same as that as this as that as this like the, literally <laughs> simplifying the bill of materials by using two mosfets and one inductor for well okay now they do use different inductors so these are 220 nano henry's i assume these are also different ones um but they, basically, the, the, the main power MOSFETs on this card are all the same. Like, for every single high power phase, they're using the same MOSFETs. So what MOSFETs are these? Well, AMD's favorite high-end direct FETs from International Rectifier for the high side MOSFET. You're looking at an IRF6811, which uh, is, like, that. that's a nice high-end um, high side MOSFET. Very fast, very low RDS on. Like the RDS on on this thing is absolutely ridiculous. For a high side MOSFET, you're looking at 2.8 milli ohms um, RDS on, which is just, uh, well, it's really, really low. 
Okay, most high side MOSFETs that you'll see are around, say, four to four to seven milliohms. Um, these these are way below that. That's at 10 volts gate to source voltage. And I am going to be rating the VRM at 10 volts gate to source because the Vega cards all have the 3598s um, just driven straight, like the drive voltage is just straight 12 volts. So I'm going to assume that they're doing the same thing here because the VRM seems to be very, very similar. Like same voltage controller, same drivers. Um, it would just kind of make sense that they, they have the same drive scheme, same MOSFETs, same inductors for that matter as well. Um, so, yeah, these are these are absolutely ridiculous low sides like the these wouldn't look out of place on as a, a no high sides. These wouldn't look out of place being a low side on some cheaper VRM designs. And then the high side, the I mean, low side. Why am I screwing this up so much? I'm not usually this bad at this is an IRF. That's that's lovely handwriting right there. 6894. This thing has an RDS on of 0 0.0009 ohms, also known as 0.9 milliohms. This is one of the lowest RDS on MOSFETs you can get um, for for your VRM. It really doesn't get much better. If you want more, if you want a lower RDS on than that, then basically your only option is to put two of these in parallel. And that has its issues because these actually have a pretty high uh, input capacitance. So they're a pain to drive. They're very slow. But since that's they're a low side MOSFET, it's not, you know, really, a, um, it's not really an issue until you have like two of them. So normally you just put one of them and that that's as many as you'll really need in a phase. Um, so the end result of this is that this vCore VRM at 300 kilohertz switching frequency 10 volts gate to source has some insane power capabilities for a four phase, right? So pushing power into the core, 1.1 volts, 100 amps. You're going to be looking at around 10 watts of heat output. You know what? I'm just going to put volts, amps, and we can do it like little columns, and that will save me a lot of text. 1.2 volts, 125 amps. And I'm putting the A in there for some reason. I'm lit literally just, yeah, great, lovely, awesome. Um, you're going to be looking at around 14 watts of heat output, 1.3 volts, 150 amps. You're going to be looking at about 18 watts of heat output, 1.4 volts, 175 amps, 23 watts of heat output. So at this point, like if you actually did the um, heat dissipation graph for this VRM, um, at this point, we're starting to get to the point where it really starts to curve, um, and it wouldn't be that drastic. But like you have you normally, and that's too shallow, something like that. That's the okay. I give up. Basically, you have a section of the graph that's kind of linear, and then it starts to slope much harder. So this is the relatively linear part. Past this point, it starts picking up. So up to around 150 amps, this is going to be really damn efficient. Past that, it's still viable. I mean, 23 watts of heat is not like... that. That's definitely something you can cool. Um, you just actually need to start considering things like, is there a heat sink? Is, does that heat sink get any airflow? Um, well, going past that, 1.5 volts, 200 amps. You're going to be looking at about 29 watts of heat. So still viable but again you know cooling cooling starts playing a more and more important role as you start cranking up the current 1.5 volts and now we're going into basically i want to run if i ever get my hands on one of these um i really want to run it on ln2 <laughs> so <laughs> this is the, the current figures i'm kind of concerned about 225 amps 35 watts of heat output. So you need a heat sink. Like you really need a heat sink. Now the cool thing is the MOSFETs won't actually like the, the MOSFETs are fine with this um like these current outputs at up to 125 amps no uh, I mean 125 degrees Celsius case temperature no problem. Okay, so if you put like a K-type thermal probe right on top of the MOSFET and that was measuring 125 degrees 
the MOSFETs are fully capable of pushing these amounts of current. Um, actually, at 125 degrees, they could push as much as 300 amps, but at that point, you'd be producing so much heat that good luck actually keeping it at 125 degrees Celsius. So, you know, that's kind of the, the, the main issue. Now, 1.5, 250 amps, uh, you're going to be looking at 42 watts of heat. So, yeah, it really starts picking up at that point. And then, of course, 300 amps would be actually where you're hitting the actual thermal limit of the MOSFETs if they were running at 125. Obviously, if you ran them cooler than that, you could actually still push yet more current, but they would still produce more and more heat. So that's always worth considering that, you know, yeah, if you cool the VRM down enough, it'll pass more current, but it's not like it, the, the heat dissipation will get particularly better. Now... Um, the the thing is at 250 amps my like there starts being another concern with this vrm these inductors now they are used on a vega with uh set like these seem to be the same inductors used on some of the vega cards especially like the vega uh nano cards which have the seven phase vrm so these inductors are probably 60 or 70 amps of saturation current but um we're already getting really close to that. Like if these are 60 amp saturation current, then 250 amps is too much. And if they're 70 amps, then 280 amps would be too much. So realistically, I wouldn't really want to push this VRM past this point. You know, 200 to 225 amps because the inductors might start being uh, a problem at that point. Because once you go past the saturation current, the inductor... The inductance of the inductor starts falling off a cliff and that really screws with the voltage regulation because uh, the inductor stops doing its job of basically uh, filtering the switching uh, 12 volts on the on and off switching of the 12 volts into a DC voltage that stops working so well and then you start getting massive like the voltage on the output starts swinging up and down way more than it should. Um, which means more voltage ripple, which means potentially overclocking inst instability, or if the voltage ripple gets high enough on the on the upside, because, um, you know, your ripple might go from, like, plus minus 50 millivolts to, like, plus minus 300, and plus 300 on top of 1.5 volts is 1.8, and at that point, the GPU core may very well die. Um, so that's one of the, the, the big concerns. You might also run into a situation where the inductor... Uh, saturates so hard that it basically ceased, uh, stops being there and passes straight 12 volts directly into the core. So really, because this is a four phase, you'd probably want to stop around 200 amps. Um, 200 to 225 amps. But other than that, like the heat wise, the MOSFETs could probably keep going. It's just uh, assuming you had enough airflow over them. So yeah, nice solid four phase right there. And then all of the single phase VRMs scattered around the card just use another one of these phases. So to keep it easy for myself, 1.5 volts, because the memory on this card is probably going to be the highest current pull that one of these single phase VRMs is going to experience, just because 16 gigs of GDDR5 pulls a lot of power, because it's eight memory chips. Um, and a RX 580 has a memory system power consumption of around no, RX 480 had a memory system power consumption of around 30 watts. This has twice as much memory on it. It may very well have, you know, 45 or even uh, 50 watts of power consumption, and 40 watts of that is probably the memory on its own. Um, so, so is actually just the memory chips themselves. So at this point, like the memory chips are pulling a lot of power just because there's so many of them. So 1.5 volts, because um, that's what the memory chips would run on. 20 amps, you're going to be looking, which is, I think, too low, because that gives you only 30 watts of memory power. Um, you'd be looking at about 2 watts of heat output on the memory VRM. So this, like for VDDCI, this memory, this phase is just absolute overkill. Same for the PLX chip. Um, 30 amps output, you'd be looking at about 3.25 watts. Um which is still really, really overkill even for like the memory at that point, because at that point you're looking at about 45 watts of power going into the memory chips. So yeah, the, the memory VRM is massive overkill. 40 amps, 
you're going to be looking at about 5 watts of heat output and uh, 50 amps, about 7.25 watts. So th this is this is too much, <laughs> too much single phase for for the memory chips. Though there's a chance that they're running the the memory VRMs at a higher switching frequency to compensate for the low phase count, um, and that would obviously skew the skew the efficiency. Like it would produce more heat at that point. Now then, onto the back of the card, what's worth noting is that the VDDCI and the PLX chip uh, power are all controlled by these chips, and all of these chips are NC AMD's favorite NCP5230 single-phase voltage controller from On Semiconductor. So if you had one of these cards and you wanted to volt mod any of these for any reason, which I would strongly not recommend because the PLX chip does not need over voltage, you don't need to overclock this, um, these two rails are the quick way to blow up your GPU's memory controller. I found out the hard way. I killed a, well, I killed one RX 580 very, very quickly. No memory controller left because way too much VDDCI. Um, so I would generally recommend just not touching those, but if you wanted to, the data sheet is the NCP5230. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just, I still wouldn't recommend it. There's other cards that use this chip where it does make sense. This would not be one of them just because of uh, my past experiences with uh, killing the memory controller on, on a 480 already. So, yeah. Um, that's the card. And, like, I really want one. <laughs> like, especially now that I've seen the PCB, I really want one of these. Because here here's the cool thing, right? Um, this might, this, this phase right over here, that might actually be a LN2 pot clearance problem. And so might this one down here, but everything else on this card should clear LN2 pots just fine. Like these chokes look like exactly the same as the ones they use on Vega and those clear on, on the Vega cards, they clear LN2 pots just fine. So on this, they would clear. The other cool thing is, is the 8-pin and the 6-pin are all the way on the end of the PCB. So you're not going to have the problem I ran into with the 7970t, where you have the GPU core here, the 8-pin right above it, and it's just like, oh yeah, the, the LN2 pot doesn't fit because the 8-pin's in the way. Um, so, yeah, th this card kind of doesn't have any of the issues. The distance between the two GPU cores is large enough that you should be able to accommodate two full-size LN2 pots. And it's just like, I really want one of these <laughs> for all of those reasons. It's just, it's like, this would be like perfect for trying to run four-way, in my opinion. Because, um, well, if you could run four full-size LN2 pots without having to rig up any PCIe risers or anything, um, that would be really, really neat, I think. So, yeah, I think this is like, like, it's a, it's a cool piece of hardware, just because, you know, it's a ridiculous card. Now, one of the problems is the guy who sent in the, the PCB pictures, he did mention that overclocking this thing is an absolute pain, because it's a Radeon Pro card, it's not a gaming card. And so there's no overclock, like, no proper software overclocking support, which basically means if you want to overclock this, you have to do everything from the BIOS. But, um, I'm just going to throw, like, this, this is a really bad idea, but... I would try to stick an RX 580 BIOS onto this because, um, well, like, yes, you'd lose most of the memory. Like, basically, the only major issues I could see, like, there there are issues with that. There's concern for the compatibility with the voltage controller because an RX 580 normally runs a 3567B or an NCP81022, not an IR35217. So I don't know if that could cause issues could cause it like that may cause issues might make the card not boot the other issues is potentially the display outputs might not initialize properly and memory compatibility might be a problem but assuming any of like not assuming none of those actually turns out to be a problem you give up half your vram but get full proper so you know overclocking software support and on a on a dual gpu card like this and that would be really cool admittedly you lose half the vram but like Firestrike doesn't use 32 gigs of VRAM, TimeSpy doesn't use 32 gigs of VRAM. I don't really think it would be a problem if half of the VRAM went, went missing. Um, you know, and unfortunately the card doesn't have a BIOS switch, so doing that would be 
rather risky. Obviously, if you have a hardware BIOS flasher, then like who cares? No big deal. But if if you are gonna just try this, then like there's a very high probability of it not working. Okay, but it would still be worth trying just on the basis that it might work, and if it does work, then damn, like you've solved most of the most of the like the the really big problems with the card, at least what I would consider big problems. So, yeah, that's that's it for this PCB breakdown. Um, and he, again, like one last time, huge thanks to the guy who sent sent the you know the PCB pictures in. Because this is... And also curse him. Like, seriously, because now I want this. And I can't afford the damn thing. But, uh, yeah. Like, I'm super happy that I at least got a chance to look at this thing. Um, on, on the flip side now, you know, it's like... Things are looking grim for the AHOC budget. Um, but... Um, well, they aren't. I'm not actually going to go buy one of these. Like, it's just not reasonable. I could buy so many terrible motherboards instead. <laughs> so that pretty much tells you what, where, where the budget's going next. But um, yeah, so huge thanks to him. Uh, thank, and thanks to all of you for watching this. If you uh, like, share, subscribe. They're having a hard time with English today for some reason. It's because of the live stream with the 1080 Ti yesterday. It's like... I used up all of my ability to communicate, and, and now I'm just falling apart. Um, so yeah, like, share, subscribe if you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking. I have a Patreon, a PayPal, and there's t-shirts you can buy. You can find a link to all of that down in the description below. Um, those all help out immensely. And that's it for the video, so thanks for watching, and goodbye. And uh, I'm just going to press the stop button.